I want to talk about peace. Salvation is God's way, really, of bringing us peace. Uh, a peace to our lives in so many ways. And there's a peace that the world understands, and then there's the peace, you know. Every Miss America pageant, what's your greatest desire? World peace, right? And these days, men can win those. Who knew? Um, but peace is what everyone is searching for. On the world stage, um, in a macro way, in a micro way, in every community and family, we're looking for peace. And I want to begin today by get, re reading for us or giving us a familiar story, maybe to some, but maybe not so much to others. Years ago, there was a man named Horatio Spafford. And Horatio Spafford was a businessman in Chicago, and his son, his four-year-old son, had died with scarlet fever. This was in 1871. In 1873, Spafford decided that his family should take a vacation. So they were going to go uh, somewhere in Europe, and they chose England. So they're going to make their trip to England because he knew his friend, D.L. Moody, if anybody knows the name D.L. Moody, he was a, a, really a, a powerful pastor and evangelist in America. One of the famous quotes from D.S. D.L. Moody is, give me seven men filled with the Holy Ghost and I'll turn the world upside down. Well, Spafford wanted to see his friend preaching there in the fall, but he was delayed because of business, so he sent his family ahead. His wife, his four children, 11-year-old Anna, 9-year-old Margaret or Maggie, 5-year-old Bessie, Elizabeth, and 2-year-old two, two Tanita. On November 22, 1873, while crossing the Atlantic on the steamship during a, a, a violent storm, their ship was struck by another ship and 226 people lost their lives, including all of his children. His wife alone survived. Anna survived the tragedy, and when she arrived at England, she sent a telegram to Spafford beginning this way, I was saved alone. All of our daughters have been lost in the storm at sea. Only I have been saved. Spafford took the next ship. Immediately he came near the place where his daughters had drowned. He told the captain, the captain rang his cap cabin and pointed about to where the ship would have gone down. And it was in the middle of that dark, calm night, that night without a storm, that he looked out. And I imagine that he must have contemplated quite a lot. Can you imagine knowing that that was the very spot where your four young children died, drowning, and only your wife had survived? As he contemplated, he went back to, the, to his cabin and he began to write these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my Lord thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Could you imagine? When I think about Spafford's story and when we sing that song, I'm often reminded of it in church. That it is well, it is well with my soul. Whatever my lot, whatever might come, it is well with my soul. How can a believer know that? In fact, it is one of the great advantages of only Christ followers. God saves us, friends, to give us peace. He saves us to give us peace. Now, Jesus is getting ready to come into Jerusalem. If I can remind us of some history, and as he's getting ready, he looks over the city. He realizes what's about to happen to him, and he says this. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And said, if you, even you, had only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Imagine Jesus' understanding. He knew that he would have to die. He understands going into the city would bring him harm, and he would ultimately face death, of course. 
He understood all of these things, and yet he looks at the city and he says, if you only knew that I would bring you peace, but it's hidden from you. Jerusalem. You know, people are looking for all kinds of peace, aren't they? There's all kinds of peace. There's peace substitutes, mostly, in our world today. There's mediums, and there's yoga experiences spiritually. There's drugs. There's alcohol. They're staying so busy that we can just forget that, uh, hey, the Lord uh, desires relationship with us. There are so many things to consider with, with family as we have our kids. We're taking them here to this practice and here to this thing and, and we're doing this with them and we're, we're helping with this and we're, we're dealing with uh, all of that chaos and all of the things that are going on at the same time. And, and yet sometimes we might forget, hey, in the middle of it all, there is a maker who gives us peace. But in this world, there's lots of peace uh, substitutes. There's lots of miserable conditions that people find them in where they're searching for peace. Right now, America's politics are in a miserable condition. Man, talk about fighting words. This side's after that side, and, and this side's angry over this side, and everybody's ignoring Jesus. <clears throat> when we look at it, we go, you know, politicians offer peace. They do. Hey, if I'm elected, you saw the, I don't know if you saw the meme, but there's this wolf, and he's given a speech to a crowd of sheep, and he says, as soon as I'm elected, I'll be a vegetarian. <laughs> you know? It's like, okay, yeah, I, right, I get what you're saying there. People try to find peace in all sorts of things. They think, if I could just be married to this person, maybe if I could have more sexual experiences, or if I could have peace, if I could just own this or that piece of property, or, or this car, if, if I were more beautiful, or if I were more handsome, like pastor, um, if, I had, if I had more wealth, I, I jest, of course, if I had more wealth, if I, if I took a, a few more drinks, I would feel better, but none of those things guarantees peace whatsoever. And friends, I would venture to say that there's a lot of people sitting in God's church that keep trying these things and don't understand how every Christian around them can have such peace. It's because there's a lack of intimacy with the Lord. But none of these things, of course, they don't guarantee any peace whatsoever. Um, why? Because those things are fleeting. They come and go, and you'll be soon looking for the next thing to give you peace. They're, they come and go. There's nothing solid or eternal about them, and the result is a consternation of confusion. Why the lack of peace? If people are looking <clears throat> to such extremes to give them peace, I think there are two big categories, really three. I'll mention the third one, but I think there's two big ones that threaten peace. One is contention. You know, contention comes into our lives in many ways. Contention meaning someone or someone has contested your will. They have taken advantage of you, perhaps. Um, they've questioned your abilities or your resources or, abil or, or knowledge. Um, they have forced issues maybe into your life that you cannot emotionally or practically manage without turning to some addiction uh, or fit of rage or withdrawal. Heated disagreements or avoidance, now called cancel culture, uh, has anybody seen any of those road rage videos that are played? I tell you what, what craziness, right? People all have a right to be offended. They have a right to, I've seen people jump out in videos and pull guns on people and break when I'm like, dude, they cut you off in traffic. Is it really worth all that? The Bible tells us that uh, ideas about contention. Uh, Proverbs 13, 10, the first part of the verse is great wisdom. It says, only by pride comes contention. You've heard me quote this verse before, but look at what the ESV says. It says, by insolence comes nothing but strife. In the New Living, which I really love, pride leads to conflict. The original language there, the word, <coughs> the Hebrew word really does mean prideful or a prideful expression. So pride comes before contention. That is a great definition. So if you find yourself with contention in your life, 
from a coworker, from your spouse and your family. Pride is the source of that contention. If people are contending toward one another, one has got their ire up because they've been offended by the other, or the other one's just trying to be, play the antagonist because they know if they can get you riled up, it's so contention. Pride is the reason for it. It's a reason that people don't go to church. Pride is a reason that people don't accept Jesus. We know this. Those that have accepted Christ, we know that pride is our biggest stumbling block. We run up against our own knowledge, our own understanding. We've been taught religion every two which ways by YouTube, and so we know better. And so because of that, we reject relationship with Jesus and, and, and because of our own knowledge. And knowledge, the Bible says, puffs up. It doesn't have to be true knowledge. It just has to be knowledge. In fact, that's the thing that will cause many, the Bible says, to stumble in the last day because of the increase of wickedness or knowledge, the word used there, the understanding, the, the many hearts will grow cold. Our understanding, the, the, the knowledge curve, was it Big Blue did this study about eight years ago, I remember reading the statistic that by 2035 or something, our knowledge curve could, could double every 24 hours because of the access to information, whereas in the early 80s or, or mid-70s, it was every like three years because of the access to information. Pretty amazing. I think about how much more information you put in your life today than you did 15 years ago before you had that smartphone in your pocket. You were having to look up words and scrabble to make sure the other person wasn't cheating. And now all you have to do is say, hey, Siri, you know, tell me what... Shh, my iPad's going nuts, right, because I said Siri. Um, uh, hey, you know, tell me what, how to spell whatever. And I'll spit it out. Knowledge. But... Pride comes in when we think we know more than God. And it keeps us from softening our hearts. So pride is the source of contention. Contention is the antithesis of peace. It's the opposite. What else takes away peace? Well, there's a couple things. I think another big one is difficult circumstances. We all face challenges, don't we? Um, Years ago, in our church, there was a lady who was the mother of the, one of the victims from the Green River murderer. And we, she attended here, and um, she's gone to be with the Lord now, at least we hope. But I'll never forget, when the trial was going on, one of the, our associate pastor took her down to, in Seattle, to the courthouse where the trial was being conducted. And they interviewed her and him on television, and they, they wanted to come to the church and interview her. That didn't work out, but they wanted to talk to her about what her feelings were, what her experiences were like. And while there was a couple other people that walked out of the courtroom and their experiences were, um, God has really called me to forgive this person. It's only She bottled it up inside and allowed bitterness to reign supreme against that man, which, I mean... I can't imagine. I mean, how would you feel if, if your daughter was brutally murdered by this guy and you're at the trial? I mean, I, I don't know. My flesh, take the better of me. And nonetheless, here she is, and she's allowing the circumstance to brood in her so deeply that she said she would never forgive. We finally quit seeing her in church and altogether away from the Lord and don't know ultimately what happened there. But when we allow difficult circumstances to pressure us, they can really, really cause us to get our eyes off of Jesus. A prideful person's mouth lashes out, Proverbs 14.3 says. A prideful person's mouth lashes out. That's the first thing they do, not the second. I want to be straight with all of us here, right out of the gate. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God will not give you more than you can handle. The phrase from the most popular scripture that is taken from 1 Corinthians 10, 13, actually says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. In other words, he's going to allow it and you will still be able to bear it. He's going to allow it. Jared, I don't know how you survived it. 
But Hadley's beautiful, even though she's gone. And then look at what it says. And God is faithful. He will not tempt it beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so you can endure it. Some say stand up under it to give you the fortitude to be able to go through it. Why? Because of the equation that Paul gives in Romans 5.3 that without suffering, there can ultimately be no hope. There can be no character, which is built in our lives through suffering, and character brings hope. Paul is talking about temptation and what God promises us when we face the attack of the enemy. When we're faced with temptation, God will not allow temptation to come into our life that we're not able to deal with. He knows that we can deal with it. So let me tell you something, friends. If you keep struggling with that familiar sin over and over again, I gotta be straight with you. You have the power to endure it. You have the strength as a believer to overcome it. We can no longer have the excuse, oh, I I just gave in because that familiar sin, that temptation kept him back to me. I got to tell you, according to God's promise here in his word and the prescription of that great apostle Paul says there's no way that's true. That's a lie. What God promises that he will be with you and he will walk with you through that difficulty no matter what it is. Man, I need to hear this today. It's not that you can handle it, but God can handle it for you. He's he's particularly interested in whether or not you understand what happens during this trial. Because God would rather build character in you than bless you. My good friend, my precious friend, whom I hope will be speaking here soon from his wheelchair, from Lebanon, Oregon, Rick Honeman was on staff here at our church years ago. Wonderful teacher of the word, expositor of the word. Just a couple years ago, an incident happened. He, he just got out of bed one morning and was paralyzed from the neck down. Just like that. And those of you that know Rick, served here with us. What a wonderful man, him and his wife, and like I said, I can't talk enough good about him, but he might be watching today. I have no idea. I'm hoping he'll be able to share his story. He spoke at our men's conference, our men's retreat here just a few years ago. Remember, Phil? Rick was here. Those of you men, Ray, you remember Rick? He spoke at that men's retreat we went to. Me and you shared that cabin. Those beds were terrible. Oh, man. And we're going to go back there again. Yeah. To this day, and I was wondering, God, why such a wonderful minister of the gospel, loves your word, is a seasoned pastor, um, just a beautiful man. And here he is now in a place where he can, and he has, he told me just Thursday when I talked to him on the phone. He said, Larry, I've had more opportunities to lead people to the Lord than I've ever had before. And if you know him, you know what a beautiful spirit he is and and they're helping him. And as they're helping him with his movements and all the things that he's he's trying to get more movement and and, and all of these things, he's witnessing to them. And he is such a a character where he's not like me. I'm sort of abrasive. He's so loving and and caring and gentle and and, and, and they just open up to him and they share life with him and, and he's able to speak into their lives. The stories he has since this has happened. And yet here he is. Contention and difficult circumstances can threaten peace. But they don't have to. In a believer's life, Paul says, hey, if you're a believer, God will not give you that situation without giving you the strength to bear up under it. Also, lack of contentment is a huge one as well for for a lack of peace, and we're not content. We want more money. We want the white picket fence and the husband or wife with the 2.5 children and the one and a half minivans or whatever it is. I don't know the the stats. This is our dream. This is what we want. And so if everything doesn't work out just like this, I just can't be content. Trying to stay in the bubble. The video bubble, I've been warned. Um, It's hard to be content. When we see this person has this thing, man, I wish I had that. I wish I had this perfect family. I, I wish I had that boat. I, man, 
Heard about the pastor every Sunday, went out on visitation, but the name of his boat was Visitation. It's terrible. Jesus addressed this by saying, if you only knew what would bring you peace, but today it's hidden from your eyes. You see, this is the truth. The Bible says that the, the God of this age has blinded the eyes of unbelievers so they cannot perceive or see the truth. The way to peace through Christ is the only way to peace. Salvation in Jesus binds us to himself, bringing us into oneness with the Father, bringing us into that place of intimacy with God. When we are living a life without Jesus and his grace in our, in our life, and we continue living in our sin, we can't experience his peace as he would love to see us have. He sees our heart, and he sees our motivations. Peace with God, hurry along, is a result of oneness with God. Uh, John 14.1 let not your heart be troubled. Remember this one? Believe in God. Verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Do I give you? Let not your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. What great promises from the Lord. The first step to having peace with God in our life is to making peace with God. Because friends, God has done his part to make peace with us. He stretches out his hand. I have seen this cycle many times. Men and women hear um, and know that following Christ will give them peace. They know that coming, they come to the altar. They might cry. They might pour out, pour out their heart to God. They may tell their fellow Christians, I'm really, thank you for this. Uh, God's really helped me with breakthrough. And, and they tell their fellow believers, yeah, I know what I need to do now. That living for Jesus needs to be at the forefront. They know that they should prioritize waiting and prayer and prior, prioritizing God's word. They know they ought to be around God's people more than they are everyone else and, and bear each other's burdens and in the family of God and share in our victories and sorrows and, and have their faith encouraged. Christian people know that these are the things that work, that help us grow so that we can be good ambassadors in this world and good witnesses for the Lord. These are prescriptions from God's word to succeed. Yet, there, here's what many do. We fall off the wagon spiritually. We turn to our unsaved friends. They, they turn, or we turn back to the bottle. We go back to the environments and the voices and the things that, that we go back to and our old ways of thinking. But the hope that we're looking for is in Jesus. He's the only one that can give the hope to really make the change for the future. And until that vision becomes greater than our memories, we really won't know what life can really be like. If we're always living in the past where we think, hey, wasn't it great back when? Wasn't, oh, I could say that as a pastor. Remember when we had multiple services? Remember when we had the two worship teams? Remember, when, remember pre-COVID? Boy, oh, glory to God, hallelujah. I'm feeling good. I remember when, I remember that. Oh, back when we had our old pastor that did this. I remember when this, oh man, I remember when I went to that men's conference. Woo, I remember when, I remember when my family was in such a way and my children were little and now I have teenage, rotten, spoiled brats. God, what has happened? I used to have vision. We remember the good things and we inflate them. The Bible says that's not wise, by the way, Ecclesiastes. It's not good to remember the old ways better than they actually were, is the actual quote. Because we like to do that. We like to remember what was because we think, hey, what well, was was so much better. But friends, that means that we're not growing in Christ because he is the progenitor of vision. He is the one that gives us hope for the future. If your hope is only in what you have experienced yesterday and what it could give you, what high you could get off it then, or, or you can, memories aren't bad, but when they're greater than our vision, the process is backwards. The vision for your life that God has is big. It's greater than you. It's bigger than you. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, God speaks to Israel in context, and he tells them, I got great plans for you. Now, I like people because we always stitch that on a pillow. But later he says, I'm going to put you in bondage for 70 years. I don't see that stitched on a pillow. You know, we got to take that in context, but every time we see in, in the scripture where God tells somebody something, he's giving them a plan, a hope, a purpose. And let me tell you, he's given you a purpose. He's given you a hope. And if you find yourself having your memories greater um, than where you're headed, friends, I got to say, God has something better for you. 
Choosing to stay in the same place of contention or the same place of addiction and and desperation we've always been in is not the answer. Peace with God is the result or the fruit of oneness with God and intimacy with him. And I know, friends, that that's his heart. Why do I know? Because the Bible tells me he's my loving heavenly father who not only brings me correction and rebuke and the things that I need along the way as a son, but he also loves me as a son. And I gotta tell you, the love that I have for my four sons is great. I would give my life and everything I have for any one of them, except my motorcycles, maybe till I'm, when I'm dead. <laughs> anything that I have, you feel that way about your children, right? They are your children, you love them, you, you give them... And yet my heavenly father loves me more than that. In fact, Jesus puts this equation, unless your love for your kids seems like hate in comparison to your love for me, then you don't love me. In other words, God's place of oneness with him is very exclusive. Do you love your heavenly father like that? That Jesus has given you access, his, his great love that is extended from God. God's peace is unlike any other. The Bible says in John 16, 33, the scripture we read part of earlier, verse 27, but he says, I have told you these things so that in this world you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. How many know that? Yeah, I got some trouble. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Can you have peace during difficult trying times? when your circumstances seem entirely and utterly unchangeable? Yes, you can. You can experience a a tranquility so profound and so reassuring that keeps you deep within a peace that's in spite of your circumstances. It's based on your security with the one who knows you, the only one who can truly give you unshakable peace. God's plans for every believer is to live in meaningful, enduring peace as well. It's not like the world's peace. Like Jesus said earlier in verse 27, you know the song, don't worry, be happy, don't worry, be happy. I I guess, right? It lasts for a while. And we do choose our attitudes. Don't get me wrong. There's a great book out by Jimmy Evans that says that. You choose your attitude. Friends, Jesus is your peace. No matter what comes your way, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of it, there is a a serenity, there is a tranquility, there is a place with him that anchors your soul. Have you ever felt scattered, like you got too many things going on at once? Too many projects going on? Um, I know what that's like right now. Maybe you're spinning a lot of plates. In the middle of all that, not that the plates might not go away, but your witness in this world is that you will have a peace in spite of those situations, in spite of those circumstances. Isaiah 26.3, the scripture says, the steadfast of mind will keep you in perfect peace because he trusts, because he trusts in you. The goodness of our God is that that we are trusting in him, that he is the one that that we put our confidence in. God's peace is more than simple interruptions to chaos. I have heard people describe peace as just the absence of chaos, but that's not what it is because all all of us are living in chaos. We are right smack dab in the middle of it most days. Many people believe that, that peace comes in moments. Few and far between, you know, the ones where everybody's just standing around just reloading. (laughs) I mean, you've been to Thanksgiving dinners with family members that are kind of unpopular. You're just waiting for the peace, the quiet, the settle because you know the conflict or the chaos is about to ensue and everybody's just reloading. They're just getting ready. God's peace is not like that. It's lasting, and it is in the middle of the storm. It, got, it is a peace that we can have despite our circumstances, despite the chaos, despite the war that you're in. God's peace is the peace that you can carry with you when your loved one 
dies. God's peace is a peace that never leaves when the money runs out. God's peace is a peace that when you failed, God's peace will overcome your guilt. He is greater than your heart and knows all things. God's peace is there when you suffer. God's peace is that calm of mind and calm of heart and spirit that's not ruffled when you face adversities, overclouded by a remorseful, guilty conscience, or disturbed by fear no matter what you've done. God's peace will still be there because he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Though you turn from him, though you run from him, though you turn back even to that familiar sin and can return back to the vomit, God still loves you with his peace. He still opens his arms towards you with his love no matter what you've done. You see, peace to the human condition means a lot. After every war, America would we build a peace monument. This summer, I took a motorcycle ride, as you know, from coast to coast. So we left Long Beach, Washington, and we rode 66 hours to Jersey Shore. It was a trip. Me and my cousin Adam, and he was on a Harley, so I'm surprised he made it. But we, may, we got there anyway. Go triumph. Anyway, so we got over there, and we were, I was exhausted. I was just, uh, my rear end hurt. Now, on my bike, you can stand up for long periods of time. It's made that way. It's an adventure type bike. So anyway, I was really relieved for that, and I had this awesome seat. I mean, it doesn't matter how cushy a seat. If you have to sit for, <laughs> you know, three solid days in anything, even in a car, it's quite a lot. But we took on the challenge for three days. We made it in 66 hours. And when we got there, his odometer showed 60 more miles than mine, 70. 3,000 miles, 70, mile and a, 70 miles discrepancy over 3,000. So he hurries. We go to the gas station. He fills up his tank, takes a picture of the receipt with his odometer to win the contest. And I'm like, wait, I haven't won yet. I, my bike's still... So we had to ride 35 miles up the freeway, all the way back up in the storm, and all the way back down, just to get the miles. The storm was great. When we got there, our destination at Jersey Shore, there was lightning and thunder, and it was raining so hard, I was following simply the taillights in the car in front of me. Adam was behind me. And we, we got off, we pulled off this off-ramp and got into the gas station under some shelter and, and we looked at the, the thing, and we, we decided that the rain was going this way. And so we were going to go the other way. We went the other way, avoided all the rain. I wound up being in states I'd, I'd never been in before. It was great. But the point of it is, going away from the storm required action. It required me to do an about face. It wasn't the destination I was hoping for. It wasn't the place we had planned. We had to go back a couple hours the next day just to get back to where we needed to be to pick up the guy we needed. But we, we, we had to go the opposite direction in order to fulfill the obligation. Friends, I got to tell you, that's what peace is with God. When the enemy and the world keeps calling you to do the same thing, to satisfy and live in that contention, God's peace is when we choose to say, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to follow the Lord away from that thing, away from the noise of those people, out of those environments. It wasn't that long ago it, we had um, uh, Bob Mortimer here. Remember, he's in a wheelchair. He, he, he lost three limbs and biked across America. What a story. Remember him saying that when he got saved, he had to withdraw from friendships with people that he knew would continue to drag him back down the same trail and the same doubts. Friends, it's going to take some initiative. Peace in the human condition means a lot. It's a war. And in every war, there's a monument established, like America's monuments. Across our trip in America, we saw some monuments. We saw Mount Rushmore and other things. There's monuments for war, especially, and we honor those. I think it's time that we take time to say, God, I, I would love for you to set up a monument just for me to remember, but Lord, just to look back occasionally, because Lord, make my vision greater than my memories.
Galatians 5 gives us the prescription. It says, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the result of relationship with God's Holy Spirit is peace. Is peace. 